Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Program number two. So uh, I guess you've all had your refreshments and we can get back to work again. Go right back to Daniel chapter 9 and we'll pick up where we left off. And uh, just in case there's a new listener, we're a simple verse-by-verse Bible study. I want people to understand that. And uh, we uh, don't claim to have all the answers but uh, we seem to keep the majority satisfied <laughs> anyway because uh, once in a while somebody will, will call or write and they think they've got me trapped. But you know what the problem usually is? They misunderstood me, see? And I can show what the book says. Oh, see, and I said, well, you thought you had me, but you didn't. So uh, anyway, it makes it interesting. Okay, for those of you here in the studio, we're in Daniel once again, chapter 9. Let's just go back where we left off after verse 26. That after those total of 483 years from the Messiah's, I mean from Nehemiah's decree to go back and rebuild the city would take us up to 29 A.D. and the time of the crucifixion. All right, now then the point I just have to keep driving home. Remember now what this verse says that this man Antichrist, the prince that shall come, he's called various things throughout Scripture, he's called the son of perdition, that wicked one, and so forth, he will have to come out of what at one time was the Roman Empire. And I will never deviate from that because that's what it says. This prince that's coming will come out of the empire that will destroy Jerusalem and the temple, which was the Roman Empire in 70 A.D. Now, don't forget, Daniel is writing clear back here in 500 and some B.C. It's still in the time of the Mede and Persian Empire, so it's going to have to fall under the Greek Empire. The Greeks are going to run for a couple hundred years before the Romans come in. But see, Daniel's got it all straight already, see? And that's the miracle of Scripture. All right, now then, this prince that shall come, will follow him down into verse 27. And when he makes his appearance, the first thing he will do, in fact, I maintain that this is what will open the seven-year clock. The clock will start ticking those final seven years when this prince that's coming, this man Antichrist, will make a treaty in the Middle East. All right, let's look at it. Verse 27, he shall confirm or bring about a covenant or a treaty with many for seven years. Now, like so many portions of Scripture, I think God gives us credit for having a little bit of brain and that we can look at some of these things and put it together, we, even though it doesn't say it word for word. If he's going to make a treaty with many, with our understanding now of the whole Middle East scenario, who are the many? Jews and Palestinians or Arabs, see? You can't make a treaty with just one side in agreement. You have to have both sides agreeing. All right, so looking at the scenario that we have in the Middle East, right now as I speak, you've got Israel surrounded by 50 times their own number of the Arab world. And it's the bone of contention that's got the whole world all wrapped up in it. Everybody wants to bring peace between Israel and the Palestinians or the Arabs. It isn't going to happen until this guy does it. All right, now how will the Antichrist bring about a peace treaty that will satisfy Israel sitting there in that little strip of land and at the same time satisfy the 50 million Muslim Arabs. Well, it's going to have to be a supernatural God thing. There isn't a man on earth that would be able to bring those two factions together. No way. Now, they can talk 
the, what do they call it, the uh, pathway or whatever, and they get this from and that program and this and that. Hey, listen, none of it is going to work. Now, even after Obama met with Netanyahu here a few weeks ago, well, you see, on the surface, they like to make the world think that there's hope. No, there isn't. Because number one, Israel will never, never, never agree to let those four, five, six hundred thousand Arabs that left in 1948 come back. See, and that's what the Arab world holds. They cannot have peace unless Israel agrees to let all these so-called displaced Arabs come back into the land of Israel. Well, Israel can't do that. If they would let six, seven hundred thousand Arabs come back in within their borders, then they would lose their majority. There would be more Arabs in Israel than Jews, so it will never happen. So there isn't a man on earth that can bring about a peace in the Middle East as we understand peace. But when this man appears, he's going to accomplish it, not because he's so great. It's a God thing. It has to to happen. All right, now then, when you look at verse 27 carefully, again, using the common sense set of brains that God has given us, what can we determine? That in this peace treaty between little Israel and the Arab Muslim world, the Muslims are actually going to agree to let Israel rebuild their temple. Can you imagine even one Muslim today saying, yeah, we can do that? Not a one. But God is going to intervene. It's going to happen. And like you've heard me say for the many years you've been hearing me teach, if the book says it's going to happen, it has to happen, even though we don't see how. All right, so now look at these, uh, these words. He will make a treaty with many. Now, the many has to include both sides the Muslim Arab world, and Israel. But the Antichrist is brokering it, see? All right. And in the middle of those seven years that that treaty was to encompass, it was going to be a seven-year treaty between Israel and the Muslim Arab world. All right. But in the middle of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Hold it. What do they have to have in order for animal sacrifices and worship to restart? Temple. A temple. No, it doesn't say they're going to have a temple. But the conditions say it has to. It has to. So now we can put two and two together. This peace treaty is going to be so supernatural so brokered by God himself that the Muslim world will actually agree to let those Jews build a temple, and I'm convinced it's going to be on the Temple Mount right north of the Dome of the Rock because there's a 200-square-foot piece of pavement out there on which there's nothing but just concrete. And it's right straight up from the Golden Gate or the Eastern Gate the gate through which Christ will enter Jerusalem. All right, what more logical place to rebuild Israel's temple than in front of that eastern gate? And in front of the eastern gate, like I said, is a 200 square foot, 200 feet this way and 200 feet of just nothing but concrete, nothing out there. My Iris and I have walked over a dozen times. And every time I'm up there, I say, someday they're going to have their temple here, see? All right, but now the book doesn't just say, and they're going to rebuild the temple. It just says that in the middle of those seven years, the Antichrist is going to cause temple worship and the sacrifice to stop. Well, they can't stop if they haven't started, and they can't start unless they've got the temple. And so all of this becomes obvious by reading between the lines. Now, maybe somebody said, you don't have a right to do that. Well, I've got a favorite verse of Scripture or portion of Scripture that I do it all the time, and I don't think the Lord is displeased. Let me go back and show you what I'm talking about. Some of you know where I'm going. John's Gospel. And my goodness, if you don't use a little common sense and the brains that God has given us, you can't construct all this. But you do. You use some common sense, see? John's Gospel. Where is it? Chapter 12. Yeah. 
John's Gospel, chapter 12. You've heard me do this before. But this is interesting how you can construct, well, sort of like algebra. You can have one known and three or four unknowns, and if you know algebra, what can you do? Well, you can determine that they all are. How? By mathematics. All right, now, it's the same way here. You only get just little tidbits of information, but you can build the whole scenario if you just use a little sense. All right, here we are. John's golf. I'm just using this as an example of how to interpret Daniel chapter 9. John's Gospel, chapter 12, jump in at verse 20, honey. <clears throat> John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 20. And that's using this just as an example of how you fill in the details. Verse 20, now it's the feast of Passover. And the crowds of Jews are coming in from all over the world for the feast of Passover. But it just so happens it's the Passover at which Christ will be crucified. And Jesus is somewhere in the crowd, see? All right, now in the midst of this huge crowd of gathering Jews, verse 20, there were certain Greeks. What are Greeks? Gentile. What are these Gentile doing at a Jewish feast day? Well, let's read on. And they were among them. They weren't worshipers. They were just there for their own reason. So there were certain Gentiles, Greeks among them, that came up to worship at the feast. The same, these Gentiles. We don't know how many. Two, three, four, five. I would say probably two or three. <clears throat> they came to Philip who was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and they asked him, or desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now I'm going to put you on the spot. Two, three, four total strangers. They don't know one Jew in this crowd. How did they know to approach Philip? Well, now use your thinking. If you're in a crowd of strangers and you're looking for somebody, what do you do? You go and ask somebody. Now, who are they looking for? They're looking for Jesus. Because after all, for three years, his fame, I'm sure, covered the then known world. This miracle worker in Israel, three years. And you want to remember the scripture tells us that if all of his miracles had been recorded, <laughs> it's a play on words, I'm sure, but the world couldn't hold it. Well, what does that mean? If they would have recorded all of his miracles over those three years, you'd have needed a pickup truck at the least to carry it. Now, you think that didn't scatter across the whole Middle East? Have you heard what this guy is doing over there in Israel? Of course it did. So these Gentiles want to see this individual. Where is this Jesus, this miracle worker? All right. So how'd they nail Philip? Well, somebody in the crowd says, well, there's one of his followers. He's with him all the time. Go ask him where he's at. See what you do? So they go and they ask Philip, where's Jesus? See? All right. What does Philip remember? Now, wait a minute. When we began all this three years ago, he gave explicit instructions that we're to have how much to do with Gentiles? Amen. Nothing. Nothing. What are we going to do? He won't take this fellow and talk to him. And yet maybe, maybe we'd better. See? Now, that's what you have to do in a place like this. Just use some common sense. All right, so Philip not knowing what to do, there's always safety in numbers. What does Philip do? Finds Andrew. He leaves those Gentiles, wherever they were, and he goes and finds Andrew. All right, read on. Verse 22, Philip cometh and tells Andrew. Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. But now, wait a minute. What do you suppose they did before they found Jesus? Hey, they hashed this all over. I know they did, because their instructions had been, go not into the way of a Gentile. Go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So these guys knew that they were on strange ground dealing with some Gentile. 
So I can see the two of them yakking about this for several minutes, and they finally said, well, let's go find him and see what he said. All right, read on. Now, this is interesting. This is what you have to sometimes do with Scripture. So they find Jesus. Now, verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, is there any invitation there to bring him in or take him to them? Nothing. Nothing. Why? Well, now he gives the reason, see? Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. All right, now what does your brain have to tell you to do? Picture that wheat farmer. What does he do with the wheat seed? Well, he plants it. And if you plant something, what do you do? You cover it with dirt. You bury it. What's the result? Germination, a sprout, and in a few months, a hundredfold of grain. All right, so what is Jesus using the wheat kernel as an analogy of? His own death, his own burial, his own sprouting in new life. You got the picture? Now, what's the big answer? He could not be the object of faith to those Gentiles until he had finished the work of the cross. Got that? Now, it doesn't say that in black and white. It doesn't say that in word by word. You got to think it through. But there's no other way to look at it. And so the same way, now I'll come back to Daniel, the same way back here. You have to have the liberty to look at some of these scriptures and without violating scripture, staying with the text, you put two and two together and get four. All right, so if this man Antichrist is going to bring about a peace treaty that's going to bring about a temple at which he can stop the worship, he had to include in that peace treaty the permission from the Arab world for Israel to build a temple. Now, it won't be a gold and silver edifice like Solomon's. I maintain it's in a warehouse in Jerusalem right now, prefabbed and ready to go out and get set up and be functioning in less than a week's time. But it's going to happen. I can stand here and guarantee it's going to happen because the book says so. And Jesus put his stamp of approval on it, see? All right, now let's see. Am I ready to go to Matthew? Not quite. Come back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. So he's going to make the covenant with many for seven years. That will take us up to the end of the 490. But in the middle of the week, at the end of three and a half years, he will cause temple worship to stop, the sacrifice and the oblation. But... From that point on, from that midpoint until the end of the seven years, the overspreading of abominations. Now, when the scripture speaks of abomination, it's that which isn't fit to repeat. And he's going to bring it in. And he shall make it, that is the temple, the rebuilt temple now during the tribulation, he's going to make it desolate, in other words, totally unusable for things of God, and it will remain desolate until the consummation or the seven years are completed. And now we have the promise that everything that's been prophesied is going to happen to this man, Antichrist. He's going to hold forth over those seven years, and then will be his doom. All right. Let's go back. Got eight minutes. Okay, let's go back a minute to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Chapter 5. I'm sorry. I usually use chapter 4 and then feed in, but we'll just jump in at chapter 5. <coughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll just start at verse 1, honey. <coughs> 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. And again, 
you're going to have to interpolate a little bit here, see? Y'all got it? But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Now remember, this is Paul writing to Gentiles up in Thessalonica. For you yourselves know perfectly or completely that the day of the Lord, these final seven years, you yourselves know perfectly that the seven years, the tribulation, so cometh as a thief in the night. In other words, it's going to catch the world by surprise. Now verse 3, for when they, the world, the masses, when they shall say peace and safety. What's that? Well, that's what the world is looking for. And what's the Antichrist going to do? Promise it. He's going to come in with flatteries, Daniel chapter 11. We'll be seeing that later. He's going to come in with flattery. Well, what kind of flattery does the world like to hear today? Peace and prosperity. That's all they care about. My America has proved it again. All they're concerned about is their bank account. Nothing else matters. Peace and prosperity. So that's how the tribulation will open. Israel is going to have the temple. Israel is going to have total protection of her borders, supposedly for seven years. And I maintain they are going to be so euphoric as a nation of people, they'll dismantle that fabulous military machine in three weeks' time. They're going to send the guys home. They'll park their fighter jets, and Israel is going to live it up. This is what they've been waiting for. This is the peace and prosperity. But now look on to the next part of this same verse. After the peace and prosperity and safety, then cometh what? Sudden destruction. Sudden destruction. And that's what will fill then the rest of those seven years. Now, I personally think that this peace and safety bit will probably last about 10 or 11 months. And then it's going to be war and desolations and everything that the tribulation is foretelling. All right, so here is the upfront scenario now. When the Antichrist comes in and brokers this fabulous peace treaty that no one else could ever have done because it's a God thing. It has to happen that Israel will have permission to rebuild her temple. All right, now then, let's just back up to Matthew and see how the Lord himself treats all this in Matthew chapter 24. Now, those of you who've been with me over many years know that Matthew 24 is the Lord's description of the tribulation period. <clears throat> he starts right out with the very epitome of the man Antichrist, and he's a deceiver. He's going to be the greatest deceiver the world has ever seen. And so the warning is in Matthew 24, verse 4, take heed that no man deceive you. And then the next thing is false Christ. They'll come in my name, saying I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 6, like I've already alluded to, the peace and safety won't last very long, and then here it comes, war rumors of wars. And he says, be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. We're just at the beginning. All right, next verse, verse 7. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then as a result of all this war and upheaval, there's going to be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. And what's the next verse? The beginning. See, this is all just the beginning of these seven years of horror and tribulation. Now here comes Israel's scenario. They will deliver you up to be afflicted. They shall kill you, and you shall be hated of how many nations? All but one? No, all of them. So the day is coming that even America, Israel's greatest friend and ally, 
will turn against them and be part of their being persecuted. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Now, again, we haven't got time right here, but you want to remember that as soon as this man, Antichrist, who will be the political and the economical leader, he's going to have a sidekick, and he's going to be the leader of the what? The religious system, the false prophet. And he's going to control the masses through false religion. Well, under that false umbrella of religion, you see, this is what's going to happen. You'll have false prophets popping up all around the planet, and they too will do nothing but deceive the many. And then verse, 13, or verse 12, and because iniquity, oh, it's going to be beyond our human comprehension, the wickedness and the immorality that's going to run prevalent during these final seven years. <clears throat> and the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, that's not a spiritual salvation. That's a physical. If there are a few survivors coming to the end of the tribulation, and uh, we've dealt with them before, and they will go into the kingdom if they have been believers, if they've heard the preaching of the gospel. Now, here that comes in verse 14. This is what will be preached. And I had to make a point of making because I just had a letter yesterday. What's the message that the 144,000 Jews will be preaching during the seven years? Well, here it is, plain as day from the lips of the Lord Jesus himself. Verse 14, <clears throat> and this gospel of the kingdom. Now, you can't get it any plainer than that. The same thing he said, Now back up so that those of you who are new, those of you who haven't heard this before out in television, you'll see where we're coming from. Back up a minute to Matthew chapter 9, because we've got to do everything with Scripture. And again, it's dealing with Jesus in his earthly ministry right at the beginning of it, back in chapter 9. Matthew 9, verse 35. Got to do this quickly. Only got 20 seconds. Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.